Thank you very much for the uh, invitation and uh, thanks for uh, having me here. Uh, it's actually a pleasure to be able to speak about this because I think I would like to try and give you a talk which mixes a little bit of what is my, uh, what is the literature evidence on this topic and also what is my clinical uh, um, uh, daily experience. So these are my conflicts of interest and, and of course you, you need to be aware of the fact that I do have a conflict of interest with the company supporting this symposium. So when we speak about spontaneous breathing in the presence of acute uh, lung injury uh, or ARDS, I um, always tend to start from this slide and I apologize if I, you've seen it already, but I think these slides convey a very clear simple and straightforward message. So on the top two panels you see uh, an animal which had a mild level of lung injury and uh, on the left there is no spontaneous breathing and on the right uh, yes there is spontaneous breathing. And of course as you, as you immediately notice the presence of spontaneous breathing in this animal with a mild lung injury led to an improvement of lung condition. But if as you see on the bottom the animal has already a, a, a more severe lung injury to begin with and we allow this animal to breathe, this will even worsen lung injury. So I think that whenever we think <coughs> of, we, we are facing a patient in our ICU who is spontaneously breathing, we have to keep in mind two aspects. There is a, an increased use of spontaneous breathing in ARDS and this is um, natural as we are learning more and more that we can decrease sedation, we can avoid muscle atrophy and probably improve hemodynamics and, and VQ matching. But at the same time, we need to make sure that there is a dark side. We are uh, uh, facing a number of risks. We are exposing our patient to a number of, of risks, which is the risk of high tidal volume, high inspiratory pressure, asynchronous and increased oxygen consumption. Why do I think that, as we will see, uh, monitoring of the electrical activity of the diaphragm and NAVA could have a role in this scenario? I think especially in the avoidance of three aspects, so the, the risk of high tidal volumes and consequently high inspiratory pressures and the risk of uh, asynchronous, as we will see. So let me tell you a few words on, on what is uh, NAVA or actually what is EDI. I, I guess many of you are familiar with that. I was lucky enough to work in, a, in an ICU that uh, has had uh, this technology available since uh, I think almost uh, 10 years now um, but perhaps it's not still available in, in uh, some of the ICU where you work and basically NAVA is based on the uh, positioning of a catheter which uh, carries an array of electrodes. So there are, I, I think it's 10 electrodes push, put, um, put on the um, standard nasogastric tube that you can use to feed your patient, to empty the stomach, exactly like a normal um, nasogastric tube. And these array of electrodes are now connected to a amplifier unit which then processes the signal as I will briefly show you and uh, this uh, can be used to drive the ventilator and this is the picture taken from the original um, natural medicine paper that was published by Christer Sinderby who is the inventor of, of this technique. Now the, the nice thing is that we are not uh, uh, neurologists, good for us, but <laughs> Uh, and so we, we are not uh, uh, in the position of interpreting a complex EMG signal, understanding uh, all the complexity behind this signal. So there is a heavy, uh, a, a sophisticated filtering procedure that removes the electrocardiogram uh, signal. We will use this uh, ECG to position the EDI. We will see it while we are positioning our catheter but then it is filtered out and basically the machine is automatically looking for the electrodes which have the greatest signal amplitude because as the diaphragm will be moving different electrodes will pick up the electrical activity and then the machine is reorganizing this 
in a way which becomes now a, a, a wave whose amplitude is proportional to the activity of the diaphragm. So this is, I would say, the first uh, benefit of having an EDI catheter placed in our patient. We have a continuous measurement of uh, a, the electrical activity of the diaphragm, and hence we have a continuous measurement of the uh, pressure generated by the diaphragm itself, as we will see. And uh, this approach was used, uh, for example, this tool was used in a uh, study run by uh, the group of uh, Paolo Navalesi at the time in, uh, in Novara, where he presented these curves to some colleagues, clinicians, asking, do you think there is any patient ventilator asynchrony? And, you know, I... I like to call myself an expert on mechanical ventilation, uh, but uh, yeah, perhaps I could tell maybe there is a little bit of a bump here that looks a bit strange, but I, I wouldn't be sure, okay? And uh, also on this side, I'm, I cannot really tell whether there is asynchrony or not, but if I show you the ADI tracing, you will immediately immediately understand the fact that there's something wrong on both sides. So here, these are missed efforts, okay? The ventilator is not recognizing these efforts from the patients. And B, there is a, a complete flat line on this uh, side indicating that this is just uh, auto-trigger. Maybe there was a leak or the cardiac activity, but in any way, the, the activity we were seeing on the screen was not uh, indicative of, of patient activity. And as you see here, the overall recognition of this asynchrony was 72%. 80% of the experts pick it up, but uh, the non-experts pick it up in a, much, uh, um, in a much smaller percentage. And I think this is also a great educational tool at the bedside for, for residents, for younger colleagues, to show them how, how, how this works. And perhaps you've uh, uh, read the paper by uh, the group of Laurent Brochard that uh, showed the phenomenon of the entrainment, so that the patient was triggered by the ventilator, okay? The ventilator starts, and this triggers the patient. It's the other way around of what we normally do. And to be fully honest, I read this paper, and I'm like, okay, yes, interesting physiologic phenomena, but perhaps they picked one patient that had it in many years. Well, sure enough, the next Saturday, I'm on call, and uh, there's this patient on ECMO, and this is what I see. We put the, the, the EDI catheter in this patient because, as I will show you, the patient had a very low compliance, wanted to switch him to, control venti to assisted ventilation, trying to use NAVAP, but he failed, so went back to controlled ventilation, and I see, with my eyes, entrainment. Why do I say this is entrainment? Because you see the ventilator starts here, and the patient is moving the diaphragm afterwards. So I would never have told that there was an asynchrony unless I had had the, the EDI catheter. This is a kind of qualitative analysis, if you wish. The interesting uh, aspect is also that there is uh, a quantitative analysis. So in other words, the size uh, of the EDI, as I told you already, is proportional to the effort of the patient. The <clears throat> higher the EDI swing, the deepest the esophageal pressure swing, indicating that we might derive the pressure from the EDI, okay? So we did this uh, work on critical care medicine a few uh, years ago, and I, I cannot go into the details of this because it would take 20 minutes only this, but, but just to to emphasize two concepts. This is the relationship between the EDI and the pressure. So in each patient, in each patient, there is a linear relationship between EDI and pressure. What does this mean? It means that if we change our level of assistance and EDI doubles, 
the P mass, the pressure generated by the patient, has doubled. It's a very important information, okay? It also tells us that we cannot translate directly EDI into pressure, okay? For the same EDI, we can have very different level of muscular pressure generated. There is a way to convert EDI into pressure, but uh, for the sake of time, I, 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 didn't, uh, I don't want to go into details uh, into that. Another aspect which relates more to weaning than the acute phase of ERDS is the possibility of monitoring other phenomena. So this is the presence of intrinsic peak here. You see the patient starts to trigger the ventilator, but there is an intrinsic peep, and so the flow starts only here on the dashed line, and we see exactly the same finding on EDI. And if we apply an extrinsic peep to compensate for this, the uh, uh, intrinsic peep goes down, and so does the EDI. So another situation, this is not just ARDS in the acute phase, is also winning where this can be useful. And let me show you the last example for monitoring is this that also is surprising me. That, that's why I, was, I, I told you it's a little bit of a mix between literature and, and uh, Saturday afternoons in the ICU. <laughs> this is pressure support ventilation. We want to wean the patient. We remove the pressure support, put the patient on CPAP, and it's fine, okay? The tidal volume doesn't change. The respiratory rate do not change. So we are happy with that. And so we switch the patient to T-tube, disconnect the ventilator, but we keep the monitoring in place. And I'm not happy any longer, okay? I'm not happy any longer because as soon as I remove PEEP, I immediately see that the EDI is now more than twice than it was before. And there would be a whole bunch of diagnoses we have to make, blah, 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 but it's just to give you an idea of how powerful this monitoring tool can be. However, we can do more, okay? We can use this, uh, this signal to drive the ventilator. How does this work? Uh, in essence, the ventilator is triggered no more by flow or pressure, is triggered by EDI. Once EDI reaches a given threshold value, the ventilator delivers flow, but unless rather than going to a preset level of pressure, like in pressure support, it will follow the shape of the EDI. So the ventilator takes the EDI, which is in microvolts, multiplies this EDI by a given factor, and I will go back to this later on, and then allows the patient to exhale once EDI has dropped to 70% of the peak. There is also a control based on pressure and flow and blah, blah, blah. That's the standard control, but theoretically, the ventilator could be driven just by electrical activity of the diaphragm without looking at flow and pressure. Clearly, we can modulate the level of assistance by, by changing the NAVA level. What is the NAVA level? It is the factor of multiplication of the EDI. With a NAVA level of one, the ventilator will deliver one centimeter of water per uh, microvolt. With a NAVA level of two, for the same, same EDI, the patient gets much more support because it is a factor of multiplication of EDI. So what, do we, what is important in ERDS when we speak about ventilation and, and what do we... You know, there's a new technique, it's a fancy technique, or yes, I really like to use this, this tool, but I have to make sure that there is a, a, an added value. So what is the added value of, of NAVA? What could be an added value for NAVA? What is important in ARDS? First, protective tidal volume. This is a, is a non-negotiable condition. Can we deliver protective ventilation with NAVA? It looks like we can. This is a paper uh, we, uh, well, Nicolò Patroniti, who um, I, I was working with him, and, and he was, uh, he's been the leading author for this uh, interesting paper, where we compare different level of assistance by pressure support and by NAVA. And as soon as, and, and you see that if you want to relieve the patient's muscle activity with pressure support, that will pretty much always increase tidal volume because in pressure support, you increase peak inspiratory pressure and the patient uh, 
for given compliance, we receive a greater tidal volume. In NAVA, what happens, and this has been demonstrated by other investigators too, the level of the tidal volume is much less affected by the level of assistance. Because if we increase the level of assistance, the patient will decrease a little bit the EDI so that globally the airway pressure does not increase that much. So we are, uh, first uh, we tend to stick, and this was not necessarily mandate by the protocol, okay? You see we have changed the, tide, the, the level of assistance quite a lot. The tidal volume could have changed quite a lot, but it didn't. It, it fell always around 6 to 8 ml per kilo and was much less affected by, um, uh, by, the, um, by the level of assistance. And also, as you can see here, this is, I'm sorry, it's a bit uh, crowded, but this is the percentage of tidal volumes that are above 8 ml per kilo. And again, if we increase the level of pressure support, uh, we will see the tidal volume going uh, fast up above 8 ml per kilo, whereas this tends to be more stable in, in uh, NAVA. Now, I'm not, saying, I'm not saying we cannot use pressure support in ARDS. Don't get me wrong. It's still a, a very, very valid mode to ventilate our patient, and I, I, I still use pressure support very often. At the same time, we have to know that there are alternatives, and sometimes we want to uh, use those alternatives. At the same time, this was another study by, by the, just, just recently published by the group of, of Leo Hangs, who always do uh, super uh, nice uh, work. <coughs> and as you see here, we have a uh, nice uh, and stable tidal volume for patients who are receiving pressure control ventilation, pressure support ventilation, and NAVA. So these patients did not have uh, in this study, they did not uh, sort of uh, find any difference between uh, pressure support, pressure control, and NAVA. But at the same time, the transpulmonary pressure, which they observed during NAVA, was a little bit lower. Now, it, we might ask ourselves why this was the case, and it's a little bit uh, complicated, but I, I think this relates to the fact that the flow in NAVA is delivered a little bit more gently than in pressure support. Pressure support, you typically have a peak of flow, and then this decreases, and in NAVA, it is more gentle than in pressure support. Pressure support, you typically have a peak of flow, and then this decreases, and in NAVA, it is more gentle. Whether this has a clinical relevance, I am not honestly sure. There's some data showing that a high peak inspiratory flow can injure the lungs, but honestly, it's, it's very uh, preclinical and preliminary data. What else do we expect from a ventilation besides being protective? ARDS is an hypoxic disease, so we want to maintain oxygenation. And as you see here, NAVA, in this study by Samir Jaber in a group of post-op patients, as opposed to pressure support, was even associated to an improved oxygenation. So not just the patient did not worsen, they even improved. Of course, these were patients with a mild improvement in oxygen, with a mild uh, um, deterioration in oxygenation, but still there was some improvement. And why this is the case? This is the case because with NAVA, there is a much more preserved variability of the uh, tidal volume and of the effort. So in pressure support, you see that all tidal volume are quite monotonic, independent of the fact that the patient is requiring larger or, or is generating greater or smaller effort. More or less, the tidal volume the patient gets is the same. In NAVA, if the patient requires a larger tidal volume, a kind of a physiological deep inspiration, the patient will receive a large tidal volume, and this could promote some recruitment. I, my time is almost over. I also would like to stress the importance of avoiding or minimizing asynchronies. This is a study from the group uh, from Arnaud Thiel showing that the presence of a synchrony is associated with a worse outcome and longer duration of mechanical ventilation. 
Uh, there's not necessarily a cause relationship effect. It might be that the more severe patient have more asynchronies and are ventilated more. But still, I think that the, another added value of NAVA is the expiratory synchrony which uh, we obtain. So you see this is pressure support cycled off at 30% of peak inspiratory flow. And you see that the cycling is clearly too early. The patient is cycled to expiration while still inspiring, but we can uh, change the cycle of criteria for this patient and we improve a little bit. But if we go to NAVA, we now see a much better synchrony between the, um, uh, the patient and the ventilator. And this result was replicated by the group of Leo Angs again showing that the time in which the patient and the ventilator were synchronized was much higher with NAVA than pressure support and then pressure control. Now, as I say, I don't dislike pressure support. I think it's fine. So I, I'm not suggesting that we should use NAVA in all our patients. But if you look at this guy here, 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 and here, these four patients were those patients in whom probably NAVA would have been beneficial. Whereas these, these other patients here uh, perhaps would not have benefited that much from this technique. So, oops, I'm super late. Going to my conclusion, I think that we have to be aware of the potential risk coming from spontaneous breathing during ERDS. We can monitor the patient by EDI and we can protect the lungs also with uh, NAVA some form of data on outcome, although it, it cannot be mortality, our endpoint in this case, but some data on, on outcome would be desirable. And thank you so much, and sorry if it took too long. Thank you, Dr. Bellani. Now it's time for questions from the audience. So you present us the NAVAS, uh, well, excellent monitoring tool, probably well, the best one or the easier one that we can use. As yeah. a ventilatory mode, it's an excellent ventilatory mode for assist ventilation, probably the most physiological ventilatory mode. It improves lung protective ventilation, decreases asynchronisms. So why don't we should use it in our daily clinical practice? No, I mean, I, as I said, uh, I think as a, as a monitoring tool, uh, there's much more to see than, than, what we, uh, than what we expect. So as soon as you start using this catheter, there are more and more situations when we realize that this is uh, doable. In some cases, like as I said, like these patients here, you just switch them to pressure support, you go down with the level of assistance, and they're doing fine. And so clearly everything has a cost. And so we could decide that we just go on with pressure support, but still, not every patient is the same, and there is a subset of patients in which a closer monitoring and a, and a better synchrony is desirable, and I am suggesting that for this patient, NAVA is an option. So I don't think we should use it in every patient, but perhaps we should have, if possible, this tool and use it when the, we, we realize that pressure support is, is not uh, enough. Okay. But sometimes it's difficult to realize that, that the pressure support is not enough. Yes, <laughs> yes. First, we have to look at the waveforms, realize that we suspect asynchronies, put the EDI catheter, and then that's, that's our normal workflow. Perfect. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks a lot. Any you, questions? You think it's cost effective? Ah. <laughs> this is a very difficult question. I think this, this, this question uh, depends very much from, uh, from the model you, you work in. But if the data I have shown that the asynchronies are associated with a longer duration of mechanical ventilation, sparing uh, a few days of ICU, it's uh, normally a, a, a good uh, showing that this is cost effective uh, will, be, will be tough. 